This is Think Like a Genius. Tread the line of cognitive psychology, neuroscience, persuasion, and so much more than gray matter. Let's dive in as we fall into a world of intrigue. And now, Think Like a Genius with your host, Lance Fantanar. Carl, thank you very much for coming on to the Thinking Like a Genius podcast. I was very pleased to actually have a discussion with you initially about the, the podcast and the topic today. And I was actually quite excited to actually find out a bit more about your book, which we'll talk about at, uh, at a later stage. Let's start off with a bit of an introduction about uh, about yourself and what you are and what you do and what you focus on, and then we'll start d- uh, digging into some of the topics which we've uh, identified to uh, talk about today. Perfect. So thank you for having me, and I'm really excited to be on, on your show. Uh, my name is Carl Lillerud, and I've been an entrepreneur for all my life, but uh, I started as a 16-year-old kid uh, and um, built my first company by, back in 1996. Uh, at that stage, I had been struggling a lot throughout school, and uh, and it was quite late that I learned that I was dyslexic. And this is one of the core things that made me to who I am and the entrepreneurial mindset that I had mm-hmm. because school didn't really fit my way of thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had to find my own way. And that is what I do as an entrepreneur as well. I look at how the world uh, looks to all, uh, all other people. And then I try to find alternative routes or alternative solutions or see what I can do to improve the current situation. Okay. There's, that's something which I think is really, really interesting because I've done a bit of research on dyslexic um, people and how they actually think and approach things. And because they've, they struggle with actually reading and uh, learning through that way, they seem to be a lot more organizationally focused and seem to be a lot more about figuring out thing, how things work in a different way. So what was the key thing that you've learned and that you've been able to do because of that? And how, how does your approach differ to what you can see other uh, people think and approach things? At first, one of the very key components is that I, at the very early stage in life, learned that it's not easy. You have to struggle to get to where you want to be. And it's always possible to find alternative solutions. When you go you know, when you go to school and, and the teacher says you uh, teach whatever it is that they're teaching, you're told one truth. But uh, as an entrepreneur and as a, as a dyslexic and and as a uh, a person that always liked to try to think outside the box and find alternative paths and routes, uh, I learned that in almost every situation you can ask some more questions and find some other alternative solutions. This is probably quite key in that your questioning seems to be the most important aspect of about pulling out the, a way of actually looking at things from a different perspective. Yeah, definitely. When you, so what is your, you could say almost your methodology when it comes to questioning and actually investigating things and start looking at things from a different perspective. Because obviously the first thing is is actually framing the the the, the issue and actually identifying the issue. Um, and secondly is actually that I think you mentioned it in your TED talk, which we'll 
talk about later is that being able to frame or identify the problem uh, you mentioned is as halfway to actually solving the problem. So how would you look at it to start one identifying the problem to start framing a solution to to the problem? Um, to start with, you need to understand the problem. Mm-hmm. If you don't understand the problem, you will, not, you will have a very hard time solving that problem. And most people believe that the the first question is a question that they need to answer, sort of. But in reality, when you look at a problem, a question, or some other type of complexity, it's quite common that um, there's something else that's causing this situation mm-hmm. or that the the truth lies in in a more complex answer and you will not get there if you don't know how to ask the right questions mm-hmm. so at first you need to not just accept the assumption by challenge uh, but challenge the assumption a little bit and see if, if that assumption actually is correct. Um, so let's say that, uh, uh, I think you should edit this out because I can't really find a good example right now. Um, do you have any good example that we can play with? Um, let's say you are starting up a new business. Yeah. Um, whether it's an online business or whether it's something traditional, kind of a traditional approach, but you want to present it in a slightly different way or to present a solution to a, a, a problem, um, how would you go about, first of all, identifying, one, whether the business is valid, and two, what the underlying need is for that business? That that should be uh, an example I can I can think of. Yeah, that's per, that's a great example. So you have an idea that uh, that you want to run with. Uh, it's some sort of business idea. You don't know if uh, your idea is is applicable to the uh, expected customer. Uh, will they uh, like the product? And more importantly, will they pay for your product? Mm-hmm. And uh, if so. Will that product be sold online or in physical stores? Uh, there is many, many questions here that you should add to the to the mix. But at first, you you have this idea that you want to sell. Let's say it's a wall fixed uh, bottle opener, um, and if you say that this wall fixed bottle opener can actually open cans, it can open. Uh, whatever thing uh, that is uh, locked uh, or closed, uh, like lids on on jars and so on. Uh, Okay, perfect. But if you start to investigate this further, who actually needs this type of product, then you would probably uh, realize that elderly people uh, that don't have as firm grip any longer in their hands would would uh, really love this type of product. Mm-hmm. And as you start questioning how to market to them, you will see that their their scope of of uh, input or the, the areas that they are following where you could try to market your product is quite limited. So what you see is that they most probably are not as internet uh, wise or as connected up as a uh, younger generation, which leads to fiscal ads in the magazines and uh, on TV. And that limits your scope a lot. Uh, but also that uh, probably the, the store that you would normally buy this type of item is might not be the best place. Maybe you should focus more on, on, uh, stores that focus on help uh, products that help elderly. Um, but if you try t- to twist this uh, somewhere around and see what other uh, alternatives there might be, it could be that there are products that are actually always delivered with a lid that is not as easy to open. Maybe you could actually sell this product as a bundle with those type of products. I'm thinking of 
um, paint cans, for example. Like if you come up with this really smart way of opening uh, buckets with paint and so on, maybe you could actually patent that type of product and, and have the producers of the paint to ship it with their product. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's why I'm, I'm meaning that try to think of this first assumption that you want to build something that opened lids in a, in an easy way and then see what other type of lids there might be and what other type of channel channels you might be able to go through to, to easier sell your product. Part of that's also understanding what your customer requirement is and, and being very clear about what the need is and how it's going to solve a problem. Definitely. So, no. uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, as you said, we need to understand our customer. We need to understand their, uh, the problem that they are experiencing because your solution might not actually be connected to the problem that your customers are experiencing mm-hmm. or the price of your solution might be higher than what they feel is worth paying for solving their problem. Like, for example, if, if, uh, if an elderly person would have a problem opening uh, cans of, uh, of jelly or whatever, um, they would probably not want to pay $200 for, for this device uh, because then they feel it, it's acceptable to have to struggle a bit with that can and, and potentially uh not be able to open all, all of them even yeah uh but if your device would cost 50 cents then that is something that is in a totally different uh area of interest but also if your device would be solving some other problems then your your way of marketing the product might be um able you might be able to attract uh, far more clients so yeah try to see what you can do to really narrow down and then when you have done that uh, when you have found your persona or your uh, the best possible client to sell to then you can uh, start looking at uh, bells and whistles to your product but at first it's really important to try to find the exact right person to sell to so what you want to do is to uh, to make sure that everyone that sees your product want to buy it, but not that everyone that you uh, that are able to see your product would want to buy it. But you only present it to the people that are the exact right combination of of uh, of lifestyle and requirements. Hmm. Stepping back, but to the dyslexic part um how have you found that being dyslexic has benefited you in comparison to other people oh it's it's an ability it's definitely not a handicap it's Mm -hmm. uh it's one of my super strengths uh that makes me want to go further want to work harder and want to find and understand the situation, find solutions, but more importantly, understand why we need this thing or why the problem exists in the way that it does. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, going back to school again, when when I was taught to um, to learn something in school by memorizing, it didn't really fit my way of learning because memorizing does not connect to me learning something uh, and as a dyslexic I believe that I needed to understand why things were the way they were so it, in some situations it took longer for me to to get to the point where other were because they just accepted it without questioning it mm-hmm. but in the end I understood it from 
far more angles so that I could could apply that finding and that learning uh, or that understanding into other situations at a later stage, making me uh, be the winner in, in every situation as I actually could apply complex uh, methods and ideas to other situations. So uh, talking about how you are looking and, and applying it, so you, you, you try and find ways of relating what it is that you're learning to other parts of your, uh, say, knowledge, problem solving or something else. And then you're very much looking at applicable parts of, of what you're learning instead of just learning for the sake of learning. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. So let's take an example there. Most people, when we meet someone, uh, we try to put them in a box. Like, mm -hmm. okay, this person is the same as these other people that I have met. And then, uh, let's say I'm a, an entrepreneur. So you would put me in the box with all the people that you met that are entrepreneurs. And you know that I'm, uh, uh, I'm male, so you would put me in the entrepreneurial male box. Uh, and then... After a while, as, as our discussion goes on, you will find more and more features that I carry with me and that would define the box that I'm in more and more. But mm -hmm. it's for most people, it's very complicated to add one new box to your set of boxes. You always want to have the ability to sort of compare things with other situations or other things that I, you have experienced before. In my situations, I always try to add new boxes. So I don't, I, I try to get to the point where I can add, add one more box in my data bank, so to say. So instead of trying to say, okay, so this guy is the same as this other person, let's say Roger. Uh, instead, I try to say, okay, so this person is, a little bit like Roger, a little bit like Tom, and a little bit like Anna. Uh, let's uh, create a new box for him and put him in there, uh, but let's connect him to these other impressions that I have from other people. And mm -hmm. so I sort of draw like a mind map in my head with all these dots connected. Uh, and I, I try to always make my mind map evolve instead of trying to just put everybody in, in the same uh, boxes. That's quite interesting because it's, you are expanding a lot of the processes that you could say the brain uses on a, uh, on a, on a normal basis when it actually starts building up, uh, you could say knowledge bases or people. Um, Cause my understanding of it is that, the, the brain learns one through pattern recognition and two through categorization. It starts with general categories and then more specific categories, um, which you quite correctly highlight is that you've got an entrepreneur, you've got a business, you've got a man, you've got these are the way that the brain structures information to make it easier and faster to actually process information. But people can get comfortable just using these standard categories to quickly structure information and then they can actually miss some of the additional complexity which comes in which you highlighted is that you start looking at cross-pollinating information across multiple people which makes memorizing things a lot easier because it creates something unique about as the person you've named say roger and because you've got correlation across various people but you also have it unique enough for adding additional, you could say, information structures and categorization and additional features or characteristics to make it easier for that person to be memorable and to be able to recall the information a lot easier. I think what you've highlighted over there is a really interesting aspect of being very open-minded with the way that you are approaching and also listening and learning because it's it's something that i've tried to use a lot more instead of being quite inflexible or being very 
formulaic in the way that uh, I process information. I try and look at information for the sake of information and then see how it actually fits into the whole scheme of things because now what you start talking about is that you've got a lot of associated content or information which all maps back to a person which builds up almost like uh, contextual information gives a lot more you could say depth to the information that you're learning from or, or the information that you're receiving do you do yeah. you have that very much almost like an informational level uh, perspective or view on on learning and and when when you're meeting people and uh, situations yeah definitely uh, and that's the way I like to work, like adding as much data as possible to a situation and trying to extract as much data as possible as well. Because, uh, and I cover this a little bit in my second TED talk as well, where I'm talking more about uh, our subconscious mind and how, how we operate um, and how a, a, a thought is converted into a memory when we start to connect it with all these different uh, other data sets. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, with a thought, we try to keep that thought alive uh, as long as we can, and that occupies some of our, our brain capacity. So what you want to do is to try to make a thought into a memory, and the memory is creating, created by connecting different uh yeah, connection points to that yeah. thought. Um, like, for example, in that TED Talk, I take up the example with the audience and saying, like, think about that day in the summer when you were out and uh, and the birds were singing and uh, there, was, there was some wind in the air and you could feel, feel the smell from, from summer. And everybody in the audience will be able to connect to their own situation, a memory that somewhat recalls what I just gave them as, as a set of search uh, tools. And that is how, how we should work. We should not be memorizing things just to memorize them. We should memorize things based on uh, patterns, based on, on these data points that you can connect to other things. And by doing so, you will become so much more efficient at collecting information and understanding situations, people, uh, complex problems, and so on. Yeah, I I fully agree with you. This it's the more contextual information and the more it's relevant to you the easier it is to, one, remember the information, the easier it is to actually recall the information because it ties into a number of other things because it's because it's personal to you. There's also a certain amount of emotional connection to the memory or the thought or the information, which makes it a lot easier to actually remember something or recall something, yeah. which is I find is, is quite key, which is although... I tend to be slower when, when it comes to learning information because I try and relate it and tie it back and correlate it with the information that I have and try and make it personable by trying to connect it to something that is very personal to me because it makes the learning process so much more richer. It's a lot slower because you're not just processing information for the sake of processing information. You're learning for the sake of using it to your own benefit yeah which is exactly what you are talking about yeah and definitely i i think it's a it's a really fantastic way of learning but it's a how do you get that you could say lesson across to other people how do you help people realize that this is a better way of learning which is going to be a lot more richer and more beneficial to them um with people that I work with, I try to inspire them uh, and not tell them how to do things, but actually show mm -hmm. them how I do things and the outcome that I get from, from the way I do things. Uh, so one thing that I mentioned before is that uh, is mind maps. I, yeah. I work with mind maps all the time and I use a tool called MindMeister 
which mm-hmm. is a web-based uh, solution and and also an app that you can use in your phone. Um, it's a very very efficient tool of gathering information, like as we you know, as we just discussed the difference between a memory and a thought. This is a tool that you could use to to collect thoughts and and the data points that you have not yet connected to other data points. Uh, so when I'm in a situation, let's take the example where where you want to open up a business based on uh, a device that helps people to open lids. Uh, in this situation, I would ask a bunch of questions like, okay, so do you want to market this to the entire world? No, yes. Uh, Who do you think is your customer? Is it a female or a male? And so on and so on and so on. Um, And in this mind map, I would start to see that all these data points could actually be connected in different ways. So I can move them around, uh, drag and drop, basically. Mm -hmm. And I can also create relations that, uh, that depends on each other in different ways. And as people sit next to me and see how I would do this type of work, they eventually re- realize that this is a really, really smooth process. While if they were to try to write a Word document with all this information, it would take a lot more time. They would need to add a lot of uh, extra content to write the the sentences and the paragraph in the way that you would normally do while you're working the mind map you only add like the the key elements uh, and you don't need to write full sentences and so on so you save a lot of time but also you see it like like a world map you see it like mm-hmm. a painting in front of you okay so i see all these day da- these data points that i can move around and I see that things connect to each other even though they are not connected yet in my mind map and I can just make things more logical as I get more and more information. And you can see where a lot of interrelationship is between the various uh, areas that you're working with instead of a kind of linear approach it's a lot more organic in the way that things are learning and, and growing. Exactly. It's more the way that my mind is working. And why would I try to work in another way than my, the way that my mind is operating? I mean, yeah. that, is like the, that is like recording information in, in the third language. Like you would have to translate every time when you want to uh, pick something out of, of that situation. I think you've highlighted or you've you've given a really good example uh, translating it into a third language because that's I think what a lot of people tend to do is they, they try and translate it into something else which makes it really difficult instead of looking at how people process information naturally and I think that's I think part of the education system which is really difficult because the education system is structured on you could say old almost Victorian processes of productive systems of making it a process, making it formulaic, various other things where, yes, you do need processes to make things easier and better, but you have to make sure that it's organic and that it grows and develops and connects. And it, there's a way, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a place and a time to have a process and a checklist when you're actually working through things and and productionizing it, but when it comes to the development side, it's very it's a lot more organic and a lot more fluid for it to be an iterative learning process because you've continually got to modify it and see what works and what doesn't work to actually help it develop to a point where it becomes, you could say, almost say the perfect product. Yeah, exactly. One of the things I wanted to uh, find out a bit more about is uh, reframing feelings uh, and the change of perceptions. So, how did you how did you start looking at that, and how did you start 
applying that to your 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 business and your life and and how you do things um yeah it started a long time ago when when people told me that things was um they used the word impossible and uh, let me get back to that uh but when people told me things could not be done or that they thought that it would cost too much energy to get it done which is actually what what people are saying when they use the word impossible because the word impossible is just a word just like with the boxes that we just covered um, mm -hmm. each word that we have in our vocabulary could be seen as one box where yeah. the word impossible means something to some someone but it depends on the relations that this word had to other situations that you have experienced. So it's, it's a translation module of a situation, so to say. Yeah. It explains a feeling, a thought, a situation somehow. And we need these words to be able to express a situation or a feeling or a memory to someone else that we're talking to or a situation where we try to talk to ourselves. Where like, okay, I want to do this thing. And then my brain tells me like, yeah, okay, that's a nice thought. But uh, you know, that's impossible. And what I'm trying to get at is that we are sort of tying our hands behind our back with the use of this word. Because if I were to ask you, would it be possible for you to go to the moon? You would say straight away if i if i were asking you seriously like do you want to go to the moon you would probably say yes but you would follow up with yeah but it's impossible mm -hmm. but all of us know that there have been people to the moon so the answer to my question is wrong of course it's possible and if you try to dig a little bit deeper into that let's say you want to go to mars or you want to go to a planet that is so far away that it would take 300 years to travel to that planet. Would you say it's impossible to go there? I'd say it'd be, it's improbable, but it's not impossible. It comes down to how you try and find a solution for it. Yeah, exactly. Are there other ways of, of looking at it? What, one is that what is a restriction? I think I'll uh, I'll reference some sometimes uh, something that Elon Musk did with his uh, with his Tesla products and his his car batteries. He used a, a first principle uh, approach: is actually look at what the perceived you could say idea is or, or, or issue is, and then break it down into its constitute constitute part and take a look at which one is the limiting factor exactly. is it the technology is it the process is it the you know resources once you start breaking it down into its component parts then you can start looking at it and this comes back to the t uh, the the topic that we've uh, discussed earlier is that once you actually identify what the problem is and you actually look at the underlying issues and you start breaking it down into constituent parts means that you've got a better idea of actually solving part of the problem because you've now done the problem identica ident identification process to get it to a point where you can actually say yes this is likely or yes this is possible what are the restrictions and instead of now having the feeling of, you could say, almost fear and holding you back, now you've got a potential of actually looking at what you can do with it. Now there's potential. Now there's creativity kicks in because now you actually start looking for ways of potentially solving the problem. And it gets to the point where you could actually come out with something that is a product or a solution or some idea out of it which is completely separate to actually looking at the um, problem that you were looking at. Yeah. 
but it's that's just an, uh, that's just things how things develop and that ties back to how you approach it and you think it because if you've looked at it almost in a in a global view and a high level view and you start tying things back and you start relating things now you can see how things relate uh, and and potentially where some of the bottlenecks are i know it's gone a bit of a a different tangent of what you were thinking but i think that's how i think potentially how you approach it is that correct yeah exactly um but you could also uh, again ask some more questions like mm -hmm. um okay so what is what are you if we're taking the example of uh, you traveling to to a planet 300 uh, years away from where we are right now like who are you are you your memories are you your body or are you your dna mm -hmm. and and there's all these things that we could add as extra questions to actually identify what it is that you want to do do you want to make sure that your current data bank or memories and experience and everything get to add experiences and memories from this other place then potentially there's a te technical solution to this eventually where we can upload and download memories potentially or if it is that your body should experience it then we could eventually build a device with that cryo freeze our body or something like that or if it's that your dna your your type of body one experience is you could probably send your dna code and and grow a new body there like the the question is always easy to ask but you should always follow up with some more questions so, to figure out what the actual question is like the limitations and and where can you step outside the box and look at it from another angle do you then focus more on identifying the limitations and how to actually go outside of the limitation to then find a solution um i would say that i never focus on the limitations i will always focus on the possibilities uh so like you mentioned with elon musk is something that i have been applying uh, for many years in in my uh swimming that i you know, were doing all year round uh, open water and swimming outdoor in sweden and uh, as most people know in sweden it gets quite cold in the winter and um, at what one point of time the the water freeze to ice and that to most people is an indicator that it's impossible to do swimming uh while from my point of view it's just an indicator that i need to solve this problem the water is all of a sudden very hard <laughs> and and uh, the solution to that is to fi figure out where the the water is not as as frozen and the answer is that it's not frozen underneath the surface mm. so what we did was to break the surface and open up a lane where we could uh, swim back and forth um, and uh, eventually that became too difficult so we need, we found another place where they had this really big propeller that was circulating the water and as you circulate the water uh, the water don't get the, pos uh, the possibility to to freeze because uh, because of the circulation and so on and so on so in, in, in that sense, there's always alternative solutions to the most obvious one. Mm. But people tend to either just accept what people say. Okay, someone said it's impossible. Then, then let's say that it's impossible. Let's just accept that, it, that they said that this was impossible. Uh, well, I say if someone say it's impossible, then... I try to inspire them and teach them and and influence them by 
asking them some more questions. So what is it that you feel is impossible? Is it impossible to swim or is it impossible to swim because it's too cold or is it impossible to swim because there is no water and so on and so on. So, uh, so just like Elon Musk trying to, to yeah. separate each and every element uh, uh, to make it uh, its own and then analyze is this particular part impossible or is it something else that uh, that we are told should be not as easy to do and if uh, when we find that element then we break that into as many pieces as needed to find the solution and that ties back to or I think it also ties back to what we started talking about reframing feelings. Is that where you start also trying uh, where when you get to almost an impossible solution, do you then start reframing the feelings or do you is a reframing feeling before that when you actually start looking at, at a challenge? Let's move, let's take your cold water swimming for as an example. Uh, did you apply any kind of reframe feelings to that, or did you just start looking for, you could say, other ways of doing it? Um, I was focusing on finding the solutions to the uh, the situation, uh, except uh, or and and not reframing the feeling, but actually accepting what it was and then throwing that away. <laughs> Okay. So like, okay, so I hear what you say. I accept what you say. Uh, I just don't agree with what you're saying because you don't have the same amount of uh, knowledge or maybe you and I have the same amount of knowledge currently, but I can add extra knowledge to this particular point. I can do it by reading more on the, on the complexity. I can read um, about the body. I can read about... Uh, sub zero temperatures and so on, uh, but I can also uh, do experiments. I can I can get in uh, intel that no one else have by experimenting on my own. Coming back to your cold wars swimming, what what have you found has been the benefits for you? The there's so many benefits from this. It's it's really really interesting uh but one of the the most interesting ones is that your body when you when you dive into sub zero temp temperature water or actually it's it's 2 celsius uh and then it uh, it goes into slush and then it's frozen mm -hmm. uh so what you do is that you dive into the 2 degrees water um and you don't jump with your feet first because that makes it far more difficult to connect, to control your breathing. But as you dive, you have a movement with your arms that sort of opens and closes the lungs. So when you get up to the surface, you have a more natural breathing pattern. And also, as you do this, um, you get the low temperature water hitting your head at first instead of your feet at first, which makes it possible for your body and your central nervous system to prepare the entire body for this temperature change. While if, if it hits your feet first, uh, it takes a while for it to reach up to your central nervous system and have your body uh, reconfigured to this new circumstance. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, but uh, the most important part is when you go into the water, at first your body is going into or trying to go into a shock situation. Mm -hmm. uh, after a while you learn how to control that and so on, but uh, let's not go into those details right now. But what I want to say is that your body, all the muscles in your body tense and really struggle 
to try to cope with this new situation and this new temperature. And after a while, as you struggle through that phase, your body starts to relax. And they see that, okay, this is actually not as frightening as, as we first thought, so to say. Mm. Uh, and what happens is that all your muscles inside your entire body relaxes. And that is, that is an amazing feeling that I have not found any other way of experiencing. Uh, because when we go about our lives and, and just walking on the street or sleeping and in whatever situation it is, we have a large amount of our very small muscles in our body that is actually flexing and uh, are trying to cope with one, uh, one or another situation, like how we tense our, our face muscles and all that. And as you go out of the water, you are relaxed and you feel, you feel amazing in your body, in your physical body. And another thing that happens when you go into the water is that you flush your active thoughts as we covered before and the difference between the thought and the memory. All these active thoughts are kept active so that you don't forget about them. It's like bouncing ball, uh, uh, balloons up in the air. If you don't have any gas in the balloon, they will fall to the ground. Uh, but if you keep on bouncing them, they are up in the air. Yeah, that is what I mean that our thoughts uh, are in comparison to our memory, where the memory is something that we can put in our pocket and pick out whenever we want. But a thought needs to be kept alive. And to keep a thought alive, we need to touch it uh, every now and then. Like, okay, so you have this to do list, but you don't write the to do's down. So you need to uh, every, uh, every now and then in your memory, you just revisit this thought. Like, okay, I need to remember to go to the dry cleaner today. I need to go to remember, uh, I need to remember to go to the dry cleaner. Okay. We kind of loop these things yeah, to make sure that we don't lose track of them. And in a situation where your body feels that, okay, uh, this is something outside the ordinary and there's a risk of dying so we need to flush all these things that actually occupy our mind and we need to make use of our full capacity to get out of this situation so what happens is that your mind just flush all these thoughts away they're not gone they're just put away in in another memory bank somehow mm. and as you go out of the water you are you're so fresh in your uh, mind so you can really feel like you've been sleeping for yeah a week or two without no disruptions no interruptions no no situations that uh, would take your uh, uh that would make your sleep not uh, as efficient as possible Hmm. so it's it's an amazing feeling but it's something that that is quite complex uh to experience yeah so you've you've found that it actually improves your focus overall yeah definitely and you can try this on your own just by taking a cold shower yeah Take yeah I, I i use cold showers uh, quite often especially when uh, when I can, it's it's a really good way of actually improving your awareness yeah. and actually calming the brain down. Yeah, and also as you take a cold shower, it's a decision you make. Mm -hmm. It's not a situation that you are put into. Remember that, and and as you as you start the shower, say that okay, tell your body that okay, better prepare for this because this is what I want to do. I'm not put into this situation. I put myself in this situation. I choose the cold shower and things will change dramatically in, in how your body cope with the situation. 
and also try the difference between putting that shower on on your uh, on your neck or your shoulders and and uh, compare that to putting the shower directly on the top of your head mm. there's a huge difference just with these few centimeters of distance in in where the the water hits you yeah yeah it triggers various uh, parasympathetic and uh, you know various parts of your nervous system it, it ties into something uh, which is the vagus nerve which basically runs from your head down to your 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 heart your lungs and your your intestines and and by doing this stimulation it actually has a way of actually improving your health your immune system and a number of other uh, aspects so what what you've the the process that you go through is is actually improving your health overall but it's actually a, a positive way of stimulating your nervous system and actually getting it almost to reset which is which is really powerful yeah yeah one of the things that you mentioned uh, which i found really interesting is your dreaming big method before you go to bed it's something that i've tested before as a way of being a lot more you could say positive and also and you could say enthusiastic about the next day uh can you tell uh, tell me a bit more about how you came about it and what what was your your reason for doing uh, using a streaming big method yeah of course um so that is something that i also talk a lot about in my book uh and it's very much about where we're living our lives and just letting time pass by but it's quite uncommon that we actually reward ourselves for our achievements big and small i mean when we when we uh do big changes like when we're done with school and things like this we are sort of rewarded because there's um um uh, a party or there's um um a diploma or things like this but every day as you live your life you actually are put into new situations you learn new things but we don't cherish these moments as we should yeah um and by starting to question this uh, many years ago i realized that i want to make sure that me and my brain and i actually agreed on the everyday success that i had so instead of just living my life and accepting that uh, things were going okay uh, i started to end each day by saying out loud today i actually learned these things and i say it out loud whatever it was that i learned and i achieved these things as well so as i go to sleep i have closed the day with a success factor not only a feeling but actually connected this thought into a memory where mm. whatever it is that i have achieved is now a structured understanding within myself that okay so this is a success and as i sleep my sleep pattern is connected to this and my dreams are connected to this success feeling and as i wake up i'm empowered to do even more and even greater things yeah and it's a way of a positive reminder and positive reinforcement for the next day which means you've got a lot more that you're looking forward to instead of having a negative outlook on life you're actually reinforcing positive positive behavior and successes which is key to actually being a lot more enthusiastic about life yeah definitely and in every person's life there will be success every day and as you rehearse this type of method you will see that there is so many things that you actually do every day that you can that you can 
put up on that type of billboard, like mm. whatever it is. If if you start doing it, you will see that you naturally add more and more new things, more and more positive things will come out of it automatically as you're actually sort of tuning your radio to your uh, to that uh, particular radio station. Yeah. You're creating a pattern. I'll, yeah. Yeah, it's it's as you say it's creating a, a a pattern. You're doing a pattern interrupt instead of trying to just default things. You're trying to interrupt it and and try and reinforce a positive pattern and a, and a useful pattern because it's also a way of usefully using your time to actually sleep in a better way because I, I think it also improves your sleep because you've you're going to bed with a positive feeling instead of going to bed with oh, i'm tired i'm this or that you're going to bed with a positive feeling of success so it actually i think it does affect your brain waves and how you rest as well definitely so for all you listeners try to do this for try to do this for 60 days and as you do it consider having a sleep tracking app like anyone that you can find in the app store or wherever you choose mm. to download your apps and track how your sleep patterns change. I think yeah. you will be much uh, impressed with these small things that can actually make a dramatic change to your current situation. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Tell us a bit more about your book, because you've got a new book, at your, uh, or it's a book that you've been writing for a while, which is called Hacking Your Destiny. Uh, Destiny. Can, you, uh, uh, can you tell us a bit more about the, the lessons that you've learned and how you're going to apply it and what, what it is that you're actually working on? And how... Yes, of course. Uh, so this started many years ago, when I decided that I would take one year away from entrepreneurship, so to say. Mm -hmm. uh, I had been going full throttle uh, on a venture for quite some time and I needed uh, some time away from, from uh, doing all these things that I normally do, running multiple businesses at the same time and so on. Um, but it's not easy to just switch off a brain that sort of always look for for new things to do and new ways to solve current problems and so on. Um, so what happened is that my brain was going at full speed, but my body was trying to uh, slow down. Um, but what I realized that if I is that I could use my my thought process and my brain capacity to, to challenge myself and to improve myself. So what I started to do is to identify the questions that I was carrying around. Um, and to, to do, to make this possible, I wrote down all the business ideas that popped up in my head every now and then, uh, into a huge mind map that I just Try, I used it to record these thoughts, basically, in yeah. as few words as possible, uh, so that I can uh, just uh, save them and uh, move about my life as I would normally, instead of trying to keep these thoughts alive, as we discussed with balloons and everything. Um, and this enabled me to focus more on the questions that I was carrying uh, with me every day, questions that was unanswered about why I were the, the way I were, why I lived my life the way I, I did, and so on. There was so many questions I realized that I was bouncing around like those balloons. And I wanted a way to solve that. I wanted a way to find the answers to these questions. And what I realized that by writing down the question, like you would uh, write down your to-do list, I actually took some of the burden off my shoulders. Yeah. And when I wrote down the questions, I realized that I could answer the question. Many of the questions could be answered in writing, but could not be answered in thought. Yeah. Okay. Because I sort of uh, could focus more on, on the thought, the feeling, 
connected to that question when I was typing. And remember that I'm a dyslexic, so normally I don't really like writing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I learned that this was something amazing. And uh, I wrote the book as a mind map. So I started with writing down all the questions as a big mind map. And then from Mm -hmm. each of these different uh, uh, thoughts and and, uh, questions that I was carrying around, I drag out some some new um, bullets or create the pattern around each and every one. Mm -hmm. And I realized that by answering one question, I found the answer to another question and how they connected to each other, how they interfered with each other and how they uh, were holding me back. So this is something that I explain more in detail in the book. Uh, yeah. And I have found it to be a really, really powerful source for me to, to improve myself, but also to be more relaxed about who I am, why I am the way I am and, uh, and how I cherish my life sort of. Mm. But the book is, is written like a backwards diary, uh, like a diary that starts from the beginning of my life, where I explain so many things about these different situations that I have been into. And uh, I have made it in a way that I like, to share with, with the rest of the world, where I open with a, with a question and uh, then I follow up with, with uh, my findings and my learnings connected to, to uh, tracking down the answer to this question. Yeah. And after that, I follow up with a sequence, like a training sequence, where if you follow these sequences, you can actually convert my question or my problem into something that fits your life. So every chapter is written like a small improvement uh, method for uh, for the reader. Okay. Because as, well, you, as you know by now, uh, it's something that uh, I really uh, like to do. I like to help people based yeah. on my experience and my knowledge and my understanding and, and the way I always question things. So was that your purpose to actually write the book in that way? Was it, was that something that just developed out of the, 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 the book as you started writing it? Uh, at first I wrote the book, the book only for me. Yeah. Um, and when I, decided that I wanted to make this into a book for other people to read, I realized that maybe my life story is not as interesting to the general public as if I were to convert my life story into a method that other people could apply to make their life into something extraordinary. And also to understand that their life actually is extraordinary. So at the beginning, my book was just something for me and it evolved into something to help whoever is out there that want to get more out of their own life, but potentially don't even know that they want to get more out of their own life, but that they're, uh, as they read the book, they realize that they too carry around these questions because all of us do. We all, yeah. all of us carry around questions that we don't seek the answer to. We just have this question and we have had it for, for so many years. And by walking around with that question for so many years, we create this feeling that it should just be there because otherwise, obviously we would have answered the question and wouldn't be bothered about it. But maybe when the question arise, when that first happened, that you want to figure out why whatever it is that you are carrying around is the way it is, 
maybe you didn't have the tools, the knowledge, the experience to be able to answer it right there and then. But today, maybe you have that. Yeah. Wow, that's... When when is the book coming out? Uh, the idea was that it's uh, being launched in uh, late May. Uh, yeah. It's still my goal to launch it in the late May. Um, so the best way to know about the actual book launch is to go to my website, Carl Lillrud, that's K-A-R-L-L-I-L-L-R-U-D.com, and then go to the author section uh, where you can subscribe to know more about the launch. Uh, yeah. Because even though uh, as I want it to be launched at a particular date, it's not always the way that uh, the public, publishing houses are operating. Yeah. Yeah. What I'll what I'll do is I'll I'll share your website and also um, your TED talks uh, on the show notes because I think they're well worth listening to and I think there's a, there's a lot of information actually still in the TED talks which we've not even touched on. I mean, the what what we've discussed over here has has, has been fantastic, especially with regards to uh, the you know, the challenges there that you've actually used to your benefit is, you know, dyslexia because it's it's something that I've been curious about for quite a long time. I've spoken to a number of people about it, but I've never really had anybody that, that I could actually interview to actually say to them, look, you you have got a massive advantage because of the way that you think. And it's it's been fantastic to actually speak with you. Yeah, it's been really interesting to be part of your podcast as well. And thank you for having me. Carl, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. I really do appreciate your time. And I wish you the very best for your uh, book launch. Uh, I've signed up to to the uh, launch to actually uh, get paid to, or, you know, to, to be aware when it comes out. And I definitely will get the book. It will be on my uh, my list of, bo- uh, list of books to read and actually work through. So I'm looking forward to seeing how things progress. And I wish you the very best with our current scenario with Corona and everything else. And, uh, you know, definitely keep in touch and we will uh, hopefully speak again sometime. Yeah, definitely. And again, it's been a really interesting uh, chatting with you. And I hope that uh, you listeners have been inspired to improve your way of living your life and, uh, and also to love yourself in a in a way that you might not have done before definitely have a good day thank you so much take care take care bye when you support and review a podcast like this from someone like lance it gains more visibility and motivates him to produce more what topics most interest you The Best Topic gains a shout-out on the podcast.